Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of vast early America and publishers of the William and Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. To learn more about the William & Mary Quarterly and how you can enjoy some of the best scholarship on the vast world of early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Hello, and welcome to episode 136 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. What do the objects we purchase, use, and keep about us say about us? If we take the time to think about all the material objects and clothing in our lives, we can actually learn a lot about ourselves and about other people. For example, right now I'm sitting at my desk, which is large and white and mostly free of clutter, and the space around my desk has several neat stacks of books about the Declaration of Independence filling it. This scene probably tells you a lot about me. I like to work at a clean space, I love books and history, and I'm in the throes of researching something about the Declaration of Independence. And all of this information is true, and you'd know it to be true just by looking at the objects in my workspace. Today, we're going to think a lot about objects and material culture, and how they can help us think about the people and world of 18th century British America. Our guide for this exploration of the 18th century British material world is Jennifer Van Horn, an assistant professor of history and art history at the University of Delaware, and author of The Power of Objects in 18th Century British America. Now, During our investigation of the goods early Americans bought, sold, and used, Jennifer reveals why objects make great things to think through early American history, how objects and material goods help colonial Americans feel more refined and more British, and what material objects and goods can tell us about the early American past if we take the time to examine them closely. But first, I have some really exciting news to share with you. The Omohundro Institute has offered me a position as its new digital projects editor, and I've accepted. This is really exciting because it means long-term support for Ben Franklin's world and the Doing History series, a series that you inspired with all your questions about how historians work and how they know what they know about the past. I'm really excited about this opportunity. The Omohundro Institute is the preeminent organization in the world for early American historical scholarship. They do so much to support the work that we historians do, and now Ben Franklin's world gets to be a bigger part of that work. Plus, the OI support for the podcast means that both Ben Franklin's world and the Doing History series will be around for the long term. Now, going forward, you can still expect great interviews with scholars who work on different aspects of early American history. Episodes will continue to post on Tuesdays, just as they have been for over two and a half years. And you can expect more multi-part series with narrative-style episodes like the ones you've heard in the preview episodes for the Doing History to the Revolution series. Now, episodes like Paul Revere's Ride Through History, which I know is one of your favorites, these episodes are fun to do, but they're also a real challenge for a single historian to put together. The Omohundro Institute has made these episodes possible, not only by providing me with a team of historians to help me brainstorm ideas and put stories together, but also with their financial support. I'm also really excited about this opportunity because of the challenge in it. For nearly 75 years, the Omohundro Institute has been committed to producing the best scholarship on the vast world we call early American history, and I'm really looking forward to meeting the challenge of producing episodes that live up to their high standards and to yours, and to continue presenting you with some of the best early American historical scholarship out there. So thank you so much for your support, and thank you to the Omohundro Institute for this great opportunity. I'm wicked excited to join your team. Are you ready to explore the world and power of objects in 18th century British America? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of art history and history at the University of Delaware. She's a specialist in the fields of early American art and material culture, and today she joins us to discuss how elite Americans assembled objects to form a new civil society within the British Empire, 
with details from her book, The Power of Objects in 18th Century British America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Jennifer Van Horn. Thank you. It's so great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Jennifer, we're delighted you could join us because your research is really fascinating. In her book, The Power of Objects in 18th Century British America, Jennifer grapples with many different objects, cityscapes, portraits, gravestones, toilettes or cosmetic tables, desks, and even prosthetic devices. So Jennifer, I wonder if you would tell us, you know, how you came to choose the different types of objects you discuss in your book and why you think physical things are things to think with and things that can tell us a lot about early American history. It is definitely a cacophony of objects, lots of different object types. And I have to admit, you know, I selected individual objects really on a case-by-case basis. I started the project initially wanting to think more about the mid-18th century and this explosion of new types of goods that people were using across the British Atlantic world. So new types of goods, but also huge numbers of goods, the more goods that people started to consume. So that was kind of my interest level. And I specifically was interested in how people in early America used objects to construct identity. So the way that they communicated their sense of self, but particularly their sense of a polite or civilized self using material goods. And because I was interested in the British Atlantic world, I really wanted objects that had a kind of transatlantic scope. So either similar objects that were used in multiple places, you know, around the Anglo-American or British Atlantic polite world. So objects that were used similarly in multiple places or objects that I felt kind of participated in this new transatlantic kind of movement to refine people and places. And my suspicion was that colonists in different places were using objects, even similar objects, in slightly different ways. So I wanted to kind of select different object types that would allow me to get at differences in different colonial ports. So all of my objects ended up being objects that I think to some extent had really been overlooked. The way that American art history and American material culture study to some extent developed, you know, starting in the 1950s, there was this kind of narrative of American exceptionalism that what Americans did, you know, was different from what Europeans had done before. And so there was a real emphasis upon looking for differences and looking for art or artifacts that set Americans apart from English or British or even European kind of modes of using objects. So all my objects, to some extent, had been overlooked because people felt like they were just too British. You know, they were doing too much of what English objects or British objects were doing. So just as an example, right, I had these city views. So these are engraved prints, but they're sketched in the colonies. And then they get sent on ships to London where they're engraved and printed. And then those printed copies get sent back to colonists in North America who had kind of paid for or subscribed to pay for that whole process. So early on, people were a little bit suspicious of those because they thought like, well, are those really American, right? They're started here and they're paid for here, but a lot of the work is done in London. So all of my objects have this kind of connection to transatlantic movement of things, which I found really exciting because it helped me to answer my questions about, you know, what Americans were doing that was similar or different. But in the past, it maybe made those objects a little bit suspect. It was important as I conceived of the project to really have a range of different types of objects because so often when people study art or artifacts, they tend to specialize in one medium. So they'll look at paintings, but maybe not prints, or they'll look at furniture, but maybe not ceramics or textiles. And so one of my goals in the book was to get at a range of different types of objects and to kind of bring them into conversation with each other so that you could get a sort of sense of the totality of different kinds of objects that people were using in the 18th century, rather than just having a sort of thin sliver of one specific type of object. Now, you're pretty honest at the start of your book when you explain that the range of objects you include in the power of objects in 18th century British America doesn't include objects owned by poor people. And I wonder, do you think the objects purchased by the not so wealthy inhabitants of early America can also tell us something about early American history? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm definitely dealing with, you know, elite people who had enough discretionary wealth that they could pretty much buy whatever they want. And that's unquestionably true. I mean, I think I'm interested in what they're doing, not so much in terms of status definition, so in terms of asserting their eliteness, but trying to get at kind of the ways that they're constructing communities of like-minded people through using and purchasing similar things. But you could definitely think about the ways that people across the economic spectrum use material artifacts to assert both status, but also their own personal identity. 
Scholars start in the 1970s. You know, there were people who rightfully noticed that artifact study and art history had oftentimes concentrated upon elite folk exclusively. And so particularly people who looked at buildings, vernacular architecture, have done a really great job of getting at the things that people in the past used who might not have been of the highest social spectrum. I think part of the answer to that question, though, is about what survives. And from the 18th century, sometimes people who work in museums talk about the wedding dress phenomenon, that historical societies are flush with people's wedding dresses and also with babies' christening gowns, because those are objects that people save and that they feel are important and that they want to donate to a historical society. But of course, they're very specialized objects that people only use, you know, for ceremonial occasions, and they don't necessarily tell us the most about their everyday life or their everyday clothes or their everyday experiences. And with objects, you know, the everyday, the things that lower class people are using really don't survive with any kind of frequency compared to what elite people were using. So in architectural history, people oftentimes talk about the fact that nothing preserves like poverty which is a way of getting at the fact that if you live in a building and you don't have enough money to invest in, say, plumbing or getting new siding or putting on a new room, it's great from a scholar's perspective because we can go back and see exactly what that original structure looked like. But objects are sort of the opposite in that if you don't have the chance to buy new things, you wear your clothes until they are literally rags and have to be thrown out, right? So not a lot tends to survive from the lower end of the spectrum. And so that makes those studies really difficult. If what you want to do, which is what I do, is to look at surviving artifacts from the past as kind of time capsules, right? Those need to survive in order to ask those kind of questions easily. Archaeologists have certainly done a lot of great stuff in thinking about the ways that objects can answer questions about people whose stuff didn't survive. So archaeology is a great example of the ways that you can kind of literally piece together the past for, you know, folks in the lower part of the economic spectrum, enslaved people, people who didn't kind of have the chance to have their artifacts survive. And I just wanted to sort of stress the way that, you know, that's an issue that we also have with documents, right? So these same elite Anglo-Americans who were the same people to purchase really expensive goods that tended to get passed down and left to museums or historical societies. Coincidentally, they're the same people who are most likely to write things down that historians can turn to to look at to answer questions, right? So they tended to be literate. They tended to keep diaries and to have letters that also survive. So the sort of what we have left from the material past in some ways shapes the kinds of questions that we can ask. I want us to explore some of the objects that Jennifer writes about in The Power of Objects in 18th Century British America. But before we do that, Jennifer, a lot of what you're concerned about in your book is investigating how Americans used objects to create communities, to feel more refined, and to feel more British. Would you tell us how objects helped early Americans feel more refined and more British? I get really interested in kind of what the mindset might have been like for these Anglo-American colonists. You know, they're in a pretty unpredictable situation. They or their ancestors had moved to this new continent. They're surrounded by Native Americans and African Americans, people whom Anglo-Americans in the 18th century deemed to be pretty fearful. And London was still the style center of the British Empire. So they are the ones who proclaimed themselves as being the guides of kind of how to be polite and how to be refined. I think the other piece of that is that, you know, Anglo-Americans are in these communities. They don't really necessarily know one another that well. Scholars have talked about the ways that, you know, if you lived in England and you were part of a community and your family had been there for generations, you know, everybody kind of has some sense of who you are and where you fit within the social hierarchy and just your sense of your identity. But when people move to North America, the British North American colonies, you don't have those same kind of built-in signals. And so one of the things that happens is that material goods then are really effective at communicating identity to other people just by sight. So you may not know this person, you don't know their forefathers, but you can look at them and you can make assumptions about who they are or who they want to be based on their appearance, what they're wearing, what they own, how they use the goods that they own. So I think the result of that is that material objects really had incredible power in early America. They have a power to communicate identity. They also, I think, have a power to bind groups of people together. So if we think about these elite colonists, you know, they're living in these port cities. They're looking 
looking for ways to kind of create a civil society, a group of people who can agree to live together and work together for the mutual benefit of all, people who can subscribe to these new standards of politeness, which we have in the 18th century. So moving away from warfare to a state where people are contributing members to the benefit of everyone. And so they're looking for ways to bind themselves together. And I think that material artifacts are understood to contribute to that process. So if you buy these goods that are thought to have a transformative effect on you, that they could actually help you to be a better person in a sense. They could help you to, you know, damp down your base passions, those things that might force you to act in a way that was selfish or that was vulgar or that harmed other people. You know, these objects could actually help you to be more civil and to be a better member of society. And I think because of the unique situation of British colonists in North America, you know, goods for them really offer this kind of magic bullet, the solution for, you know, how are we going to make this civil society on what some might consider the margins of the empire in this wilderness that's filled with people who are sort of threatening. And goods kind of offer a lifeline of, you know, we can participate in civil society too, and we can tie ourselves together with them. So let's turn now to some of the objects that Jennifer explores in her book, The Power of Objects in 18th Century British America. Let's start with an object that Jennifer mentioned earlier, printed cityscapes. Jennifer, Would you tell us about colonial cityscape prints and why colonists commissioned images of their cities? These are some of the artifacts that I've struggled with the hardest in the book. I think for a couple of reasons. One is just because they're so big. In the book, I examine five cityscapes or city views. And these are what we would call profile views of port cities in North America. So Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Charleston, South Carolina. And they show the city, you know, as if you're sort of positioned on the water looking over the urban landscape. So you see a portion of water, usually a river, and then the buildings behind. And, you know, people had known about these things since the 1940s and kind of had erroneously assumed that all of these prints of these North American port cities had been part of a set because they look really similar. So there was the assumption that, you know, they're kind of identical. And in looking at them, they're really visually overwhelming because they're engraved with this incredible amount of detail. They're probably the most detailed engravings produced in the 18th century British American context. They're just incredible. And they sort of lure you in that you want to just look at all these individual details of buildings and of figures. And they're huge. So the one that I look at most is made in Philadelphia around 1752, and it's two by seven feet, which if you think about, you know, you're living in a townhouse in Philadelphia, probably the only place that's large enough to display a visual artifact that big is somewhere like a stair hall. You know, this is just a really, really huge print. So in approaching these things, I really then had two sort of questions. One is, well, why do these look so similar? Why are these organized visually so similarly? And then secondly, you know, why are they so big? If we look at British prints of individual cities, and those started to become really popular around the first quarter of the 18th century, they're much smaller. They're about one by three feet in size. So why are colonial Americans making theirs so big? And basically, I think that City Views answered some real needs. On the one hand, they kind of visually allowed individual port cities to proclaim the fact that they had kind of made it, that they were refined places where people had constructed these monumental buildings. They were polite spaces. They were places where people could go for trade and for commerce, but also they kind of fulfilled the formula for a nice, polite city. And that, I think, has to do with the sameness, right? So on one hand, colonists want to appear just the same as other places in the British Empire, like Bristol, like Leeds, like other kind of port cities of a middling kind of status. But then on the other hand, I think the port views are so large, in part because colonists want to remind a British audience of their own potential, right? Like these are places that really, you know, if we put in the energy and we put in the time and the money, they can kind of become the next vanguard of civilization. And so they want to sort of proclaim their potential. I think they have a great incentive to do that because in this period, even still in the 18th century, there's this notion for a British imperial audience that the colonists are this kind of howling wilderness, that they're really not a refined place, that there hasn't been sort of great physical progress or progress in building a civil society. And so I think part of what colonists are doing is trying to say, no, look, we really have accomplished these things. Just look at these city views, right? And you can see what we've managed to accomplish. Now, in addition to cityscapes, colonists also use gravestones or tombstones in an elaborate way. Jennifer, I wonder if you would tell us about the power of gravestones in 18th century British America, 
What kinds of writings and engravings did the living put on these stones to mark the final resting place of a loved one? Yeah, gravestones were really the last kind of piece to come into this complicated puzzle. And I wanted to look at them in part so that I could take my story past the kind of boundary of life. I had thought about portraits. I had thought about city views. I had thought about objects that people looked at while they were alive. But I wanted to sort of think about the ways that once people died, you know, what role did they expect to still have in kind of being part of a community, if we can think about it that way? And how did they sort of proclaim their civil state or their politeness to other people? And gravestones are really interesting because they kind of allow the person to speak after death in a sense that the imagery and the words that are selected for the tombstone, you know, over time, they stand in as the last sort of representation and the last words that that person is going to convey. And I was in Charleston, South Carolina, looking at paintings and went to one of the city's many fantastic cemeteries. And there's this collection of really interesting gravestones, which bear kind of small circular engravings that show the deceased person. And so these are really intriguing and really unusual. You see a larger kind of trend towards funerary art, so having representations of the deceased person. And that seems to be happening in England in this period as well. But in South Carolina, they're really uniform. They're all sort of about the size of your hand, all just showing the person's face and neck and maybe a little part of their torso. But they are, you know, seemingly realistic representations. All of them are different. You see some women who are maybe in their 30s, some women who are older, men in their 50s, youths around 18. So they all do depict different individuals. So I was interested in why South Carolinians felt like they needed this special kind of gravestone that you really don't find anywhere else. And one of the other interesting things about them is that there isn't enough stone in South Carolina to construct gravestones themselves. So most of these are made out of slate, and that's being imported from New England in this period. So South Carolinians are talking to New England stone carvers, telling them what they want on their gravestones and picking this really unique type of gravestone, which I call a portrait gravestone because it has this representation on the top. So I was curious as to why South Carolinians felt like they needed these special gravestones that had images of people on them. And if you look at these things visually, the thing that they look the most like are portrait miniatures. And portrait miniatures are just fabulous. If you ever have a chance to see one in a museum, they're so gripping. They're very small. They're usually maybe an inch to three inches. They're usually watercolor painted on ivory. So they're really small and very delicate. And for that reason, they often get put into glass cases. And in the 18th century, they're very popular, but they're particularly popular in Charleston. And people are either wearing them like on bracelets or they're wearing them around their neck as a necklace. And so portrait miniatures in the 18th century have all these great associations with sentiment. They might be exchanged between lovers or between spouses, but they also have a kind of connection to bereavement that when someone dies, you know, you have a token of them that you can use as part of the grieving process that you can look at, then you can cry over and you can have an emotional connection to. So it's interested in how that very private form became this public monument that you would put on top of a gravestone. So these carved likenesses look a lot like portrait miniatures. And the answer I came to was that these representations were really a way to demonstrate the politeness of the individual even after he or she had died. So they're no longer there to kind of stand for themselves. They're no longer there to protect their bodies. But these representations, their perfected, idealized selves kind of spoke for them and allowed them to proclaim their politeness even though these individuals were gone. Why do you think the practice of putting portrait miniatures into gravestones developed really only in South Carolina? I'm curious because I like to visit historic burying grounds too, and the only gravestone I can think of with a portrait in it is that of John Hancock's. I mean, when I really think about it, I see gravestones with skull and crossbones and the winged skull, and most don't even seem to have any portraiture or imagery in it at all. So why was this practice popular in South Carolina and not in other colonies? Yeah, so South Carolina is such a strange place in the 18th century in a good way, but it's definitely a distinctive place. These are people who, if we're going to think about the variations between British colonists, they have the closest connections to England. They are sending their sons there for education. They have great social connections amongst the British gentry. A lot of them are traveling there and spending time in England. They also have a tremendous amount of money because they're rice planters, because they're indigo planters, because of slavery, right? They have this great amount of wealth. 
So South Carolinians are always kind of distinctive. I think one resident talks about them as being, you know, there's a great line about, you know, the city is as different as the products of the soil are as different from someplace like New England, right? So the crops that they grow are different, but so too are their manners and their objects. I think the impetus for these is really the deadliness of South Carolina in the 18th century. South Carolina is a place where malaria and yellow fever are just rife, particularly in the summer. And so you have this tremendously high death rate, even among elite people who tried to escape low-lying areas where there were swamps and what they would call miasmas, these sort of bad air that they felt made people ill. But nevertheless, they died in huge numbers. And so on the one hand, you have a lot of people who are dying and this real fear of you know, this civil population, these elite people who are going to be gone. And you also have a much greater, much faster timetable for things like decay. Right. So in the 18th century, the scientists are really interested in kind of how decay happens. And if you live in somewhere like New England, like you can count on the fact that you can bury somebody you know, far removed from when they died because the cooler temperatures are going to preserve a body to some extent. But in South Carolina, people are writing about, you know, people start to decay within hours. It's hot. It's humid. People die in pretty gruesome illnesses that leave their bodies vulnerable to greater or quicker rates of putrefaction. And so they really can't sort of deny the fact that death is a deforming thing. And so the result is, you know, they want to have gravestones that really continue to proclaim, you know, this person is a plight person, right? They may have died in a way that was really brutal, and they may have already started to decay, but we want to assert that, you know, they are polite. I think the other difference is about religious practice. So a lot of these portrait gravestones are going into what in South Carolina might have been called dissenters, so people who dissented from the Anglican Church, which is the official religion of the colony. And these are people who are being buried outside. In the 18th century, that burial in the ground would be seen as a little bit questionable. There's this expectation that if you're a wealthy elite person, that you're going to get buried inside the church, under the church floor. And so I think South Carolinians are also kind of trying to deal with this fact that you might be buried in the ground, which I think is a little bit more suspect. You might be buried next to anybody, right? So there's this amount of social leveling that happens in death that they're very uncomfortable with. So I think part of the portrait gravestone is also about protection of that corpse and asserting that, you know, you may be in the ground, you may be around other people, but, you know, you're still this very distinct plight person. Could we linger on this point of religion a bit longer? Because as we know, the Calvinist and Quaker traditions of New England, New York, and Pennsylvania allowed the wealthy to have objects and possessions. But these religions really encourage people to be less ostentatious about their outward displays of wealth. Less ostentatious than, say, those colonists who lived in other regions and practiced other religions. So I wonder if because people in the Northeastern colonies had this tradition of at least trying to be less ostentatious, if art historians have been drawn to the really interesting people of 18th century South Carolina and their objects, more than, say, the people and objects of other regions? That's a great question. You know, I didn't go into the project thinking that I necessarily wanted to write so much about Charleston. And I really got drawn there both because of the interestingness of the objects, but also because they really had not been studied to the same extent that artifacts and objects in places like Boston and New York, and to some extent Philadelphia, though lesser, had been. So in terms of the way that the field has developed, the South has really been left out until the last decade or so. And I think part of that has to do with that sort of pain of Britishness. There was sort of the idea that these places were way too connected to what was happening in London, that they weren't kind of American enough. And people were really interested, particularly with art history, you know, they wanted to look at native born artists who were painting primarily in North America. And because South Carolina is so connected to London, because you know they have English painters there, they go to London and have portraits painted, they buy London imported objects, right? We didn't have that clear sort of division of this is American and this is British. And so in many ways, the South got kind of left out of the story of how America developed in terms of its artifacts and its art. The famous comment that gets made in the 1940s by Joseph Downs, and at that point, he was the curator of the American Wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And basically, he says, you know, nothing of significance was ever made south of Baltimore, right? So nobody ever painted anything really great or made any really great artifacts south of Baltimore. 
And this got people up in arms who either lived in the South or who collected Southern artifacts and antiques or who liked Southern art. And so there's been a sort of quest to recapture both the distinctiveness of places like Charleston, but also to make sure that they continue to inform our idea of early America. Right, that these are places where people are thinking through what it means to be an American and are actively participating in that conversation. They're not kind of doing their own weird thing, but they're actually a part of this larger sort of use of objects and definition of America. Now, among the other interesting artifacts that Jennifer studies in the power of objects in 18th century British America are cosmetics, makeup, and toilettes or cosmetic tables. Jennifer, would you tell us about early American cosmetics and about the elaborate furniture early Americans used to house them in? This is, I think, one of the most fun chapters to write. And it started not with cosmetics as it kind of developed. I was interested in thinking about ways that elite colonists used objects to prepare themselves for going out into the world and for creating these civil communities. And so I thought about dressing furniture as one of those sites where they use material goods to kind of sculpt a new public persona. And one of the questions that came up as I was looking at these dressing tables, which if you haven't seen one, are really fabulous. So by the 1780s, dressing tables and dressing furniture has become amazingly elaborate. One of my friends along the way compared them to sort of Chinese puzzle boxes. They're much larger. They're about five feet tall, but they contain all of these really interesting sort of hidden compartments, places where people housed goods that aren't immediately visible from the outside. So I talk about Margaret Livingston, a New Yorker, and her dressing table, which survives in the New York Historical Society collection. And this thing is just amazing. It has side compartments that you open and then mirrors that can pop out. It has a dressing drawer, which is this really cool thing that it looks just like a regular drawer, right? But if you open it, there's all of these compartments for storing different things. In this table, there's even a kind of hidden basin where you could put your water so you had it conveniently there, but you couldn't see it from the outside. So my kind of first question was just, why is there all of this elaborate storage space? Like, what are people keeping inside of these dressing pieces? Why do they have so much that they want to keep in there? And then why why are they so complicated? Why do they, you know, have to sort of fold back up on themselves so you can't kind of tell what's on the inside as you look at them? And that led me to reading a lot of 18th century cosmetic manuals. And luckily for me, in the 1740s and 50s, people start publishing these books about, you know, how to make your own cosmetics at home. So this got me thinking about the fact that, you know, we tend to think about cosmetics as being fairly specialized types of substances that we apply to our face that, you know, we understand may enhance our appearance somewhat, but aren't going to really substantially change too much about us. But in the 18th century, the definition of cosmetic is really broad. So it can include anything that, as they describe it, is meant to preserve or improve the complexity complexion. But as well, it can include things like hair pomade, so hair gel, you know, what they would call cooling creams, what we would think of as cold creams, so things that were meant to make the skin more supple or to help retain a pale color, you know, lip balms and lip salves. Things like face pomades, which are going to be, you know, sort of a stickier, more putty-like substance that you might be able to use to seal in things like pimples or smallpox scars. So quickly, I became aware of the fact that cosmetics really, you know, it wasn't what I was thinking of, right? These were some pretty different kinds of substances. And people were buying them imported through their milliner, through their local merchant. And then sometimes they were using these printed guides to manufacture them themselves. So I became really interested then in, you know, why so many cosmetics, you know, why do people need these things? Why are they hiding them? And my interest was in what people felt was so dangerous about cosmetics. And in the 18th century, people are equating cosmetic use to painting. So just like you might paint a portrait, they would describe the application of cosmetics as painting a face. And this really begins to crystallize around women. So much of the most expensive dressing furniture is explicitly marketed as women called ladies dressing tables. And a lot of these cosmetics are also intended for a female audience. So they're assuming that women are going to be making these things and using these things. So a lot of anxiety gets crystallized around women's application of cosmetics and how maybe they could use cosmetics to kind of manufacture fake selves, if you will, to make counterfeit portraits or to make new faces that might not reflect their own emotions. 
So in the 18th century, they really think about the skin as being what some call a living canvas. So there's this idea that the skin, it's a barrier, but it's also a kind of screen. And what it enables a viewer to do is to look at a person and to see what emotions they're experiencing. So maybe if you're embarrassed or if you're angry, your skin flushes. Maybe if you're experiencing sexual desire, right, you might have a heightened color. Maybe if you're really tired or if you're really melancholic, your skin loses its redness. So cosmetics are offering a way to artificially manipulate your living canvas, right? You can falsify your emotions or your emotional state. And on the one hand, that can be really great because you can assume this public persona so people might not know how you're really feeling. But on the other hand, there's a fear that, you know, maybe women are just kind of lying, right? Maybe they're really not so polite or not so civil, but they're manipulating their skin to appear as if they are something they are not. So I think that goes to why their dressing equipment is so complicated and works so well to screen their cosmetics from view, because women really don't want other people knowing what they're applying. They don't want them asking questions about, well, is that her real personality or is that just her fake personality? And by using cosmetics, they're kind of calling their own civility into question. So the dressing equipment allows them to use these cosmetics, but not to maybe showcase that to everybody, to keep that secret. Do you know how these dressing tables became so elaborate? Were women like Margaret Livingston, you know, talking to cabinet makers and saying, hey, I need an elaborate table with secret compartments to hide all my makeup? Or did the elaborateness of these tables come from men who decided that women needed to hide their makeup and possibly even their true selves from society? And so they designed these elaborate tables to do just that. That's a great question. It's one of those tricky businesses of how people used things and how things got designed. And it's a really sort of fudgy area. I think the fact that merchants and cabinet makers are targeting these things to quote unquote ladies implies their perception that there's a demand for these things. So I think that elite women are interested in purchasing them. Though there's an element of merchandising in that uh, cabinet makers and those who design these manuals are also saying, you know, hey, ladies, be sure and get your very complicated dressing table. So, yeah, I think on the one hand, they potentially are very liberating in that they allow women to kind of assume a public persona. But you're certainly right to point out at the same time, I think they're also kind of manipulative in that they say, you know, inherently, if you weren't to apply any cosmetics, if you weren't to sort of change yourself, then you wouldn't be okay for public consumption or polite society, right? So there's an implied sort of you have to do this in order to enter into a civil society. I ultimately do see these artifacts as being something that empower women because I think that women are using these to burnish themselves and to make themselves feel more confident. I think that there's a sense of mastery over the self that comes when you're using these very elaborate pieces and you're manipulating these surfaces and you're kind of, you know, I think women are in the zone, right? They're accomplishing their toilette. They know where everything is. They're able to hide everything. I see that as being empowering. But there's also a strong strain of misogyny that runs through the way that people talk about the toilette. One of my examples in the book is a poem about Cecilia by Swift. And so, you know, the sort of the crux of the poem, the crux of the joke is that this guy, Strephon, is in love with this woman and he wants to know what she's hiding in her dressing table. And so he leaves her rooms after she's gone and he kind of finds all this gucky cosmetic stuff on the top and he sees this sort of hidden drawer and he thinks, okay, this is it. These are going to be the love letters. This is going to be, you know, her innermost thoughts. And he, you know, opens the secret door and puts his hand in. And of course, what's there is Celia's chamber pot, right? So he soils his hand and it's really gross. And for him, this is kind of, you know, this recognition that as he sees it, you know, women are just inherently base and kind of gross. So there's a strong strain of, you know, criticism of women as being a kind of scapegoat of fashionability, of consumer desire that I think is also definitely present with these. And so I see the dressing table as kind of, you know, it moves both of those ways. Since we're speaking of the ways that early Americans made themselves up for polite society, let's turn now to a different type of physical augmentation. The battles of the war for independence cost many early American men their limbs. And during the early Republic period, many of the men who survived amputation sought to replace those lost limbs with prosthetic devices. Jennifer, would you tell us about early American prosthetics and how they helped men recover their gentility and refine figures? <laughs> 
So this is a topic I never thought I would ever be writing about. I am by nature not a medical person. I get queasy at the sight of blood. But I think this is a great example of how discovering or coming across a really sort of jaw-droppingly interesting artifact can allow you to go into fields of research that you never necessarily anticipated. And I say this phrase in the book that objects are things to think with. And for me, this prosthetic limb was definitely an object that allowed me to get at the ways people were constructed much larger questions. So I should say at the outset, you know, I talked about the way that not a lot of artifacts survive from the 18th century, except for those owned by the elite. And this is a good example in that thus far, the only artificial lower limb that we know to survive from early America belonged to Governor Morris, who is, of course, both an elite, but also a political elite. He's part of this new kind of founding generation of politicians after the American Revolution. So Morris's limb is the only kind of limb we have if we want to think about the ways that people in early America dealt with dismemberment and disability. And this leg is really strange looking. So as I looked at it, I was kind of shocked because it's you know, in the back of my mind and probably in others' minds, if I think about wooden legs, I kind of think about pirates and, you know, very simple sort of sticks. And Morris's leg is not that. Morris's leg is sort of like the Cadillac of wooden legs. It is made out of wood, which was the most sort of malleable material that they had in this period in terms of its flexibility. So it makes sense that it's made out of wood. But it has a very fancy foot. If you compare the foot of it, it looks a lot like the very fancy feet that we see on the bottom of expensive chairs. It is made by an unknown cabinet maker. So we don't know exactly who made it, but likely in Philadelphia, because that's where Governor Morris lost his leg. So it looks a lot like the feet on Philadelphia chairs. And then if you look at the top part of it, it has this sort of U shape at the top, which is where Morris's stump would have fit in. And that part is covered in leather, and then it's tacked onto the wood with a series of upholstery nails. So it literally looks like an upholstered chair at the top. So you've got this upholstered part and then this very fancy foot. So the whole thing, you know, it's clearly made not necessarily just for technology, right? He could have had a very simple straight pole, which a lot of people did. But Morris went out of his way to kind of get a leg that would tie him to other fashionable goods. It would look sort of like an upholstered chair or sofa. It would look like one of the fancy chairs that he might sit in in a Philadelphia parlor. So I was intrigued as to how this wooden leg connected to all these other plate goods that I explore in other chapters. And I became increasingly convinced that, you know, it's really not solely a medical device. And probably in the 18th century, I think that's because they dealt with dismemberment and other physical handicaps in very different ways. You know, they didn't really have the medical technology to do a lot of surgical intervention. So their response was to kind of aesthetically try and hide disability or to sort of cover it up so maybe it wasn't as noticeable. Stay makers, people who made the stays that women wore underneath their very fancy gowns. If you look at the manuals telling them kind of how to go about their craft, one of the things it talks about is what to do if somebody has a hump in their back or if one shoulder is shorter than the other or if they have an abnormally long torso. So they're thinking about ways to make the human body pleasing and symmetrical, but doing that through kind of aesthetic intervention. So with the wooden leg, then I think Morris has an extra challenge, right? Because it's impossible to sort of aesthetically overcome the fact that he has lost a leg, right? But by connecting this to these genteel goods, Morris is able to sort of say, you know, hey, I'm still a gentleman, right? I'm still virtuous. I'm still an upstanding member of society. And I have this material supplement that allows me to kind of continue in civil society despite a dismemberment. And I should say, I think this is a pressing question in the 18th century because so many men are maimed in the American Revolution. Cannonballs, cannonball frostbite, which a lot of soldiers suffered from. There's this huge number of amputees who come out of the Revolutionary War. And as Americans in the early republic are thinking about, okay, how do we make a new nation? What do we want a citizen to be like? They're thinking, of course, male property holding citizens. But what do we want this person to be like? We want this person to be economically viable, able to support himself and a family. And there's a lot of concern over whether these amputees are going to be able to do that. Like, are they going to be able to become good Republican citizens? But somebody like Morris, then, he's clearly arguing, you know, yes, you can be a political leader. He goes on to be the American ambassador or equivalent to France. He has a very fulfilling and active political career. So he's somebody who's saying you have this disability, but you can still go on to be a great functioning member of the American political world. Before we move into the time warp, I wonder if we could talk about some of your analysis and interpretation of the objects in your book. Would you tell us more about how you read objects? 
I mean, why do you think it's important to recover the practical and metaphorical functions of early American objects? And how exactly does one get at the metaphorical function of an object? I like to think about material artifacts as being, you know, kind of like time capsules that we can open in the present. I think that when we look at something that someone made or someone used in the past, we have this sort of opportunity to see sort of their hopes and their fears, their opinions, their worldviews. I think all of us are familiar today with investing objects with meaning. I know personally that if I go somewhere like a flea market and I see an artifact that happens to remind me of a person that I have known, maybe my grandparents or my great aunt or uncle, right? There might be an object there. And I immediately, I think of that person. I know that they owned a similar object and it has a host of associations, emotional associations that just come up from seeing that artifact. And so I think that You know, objects are able to kind of encapsulate beliefs, emotions, things that we might not necessarily write down, or even on a conscious level, we might not necessarily think about every day. But through using them and through experiencing them and through building up this lifetime of associations, objects are able to conjure a variety of beliefs and a variety of feelings. And so I think for me, when I talk about the metaphorical function of objects, that's kind of what I'm getting at that, you know, yes, Governor Morris, you know, he needed a wooden leg. He had lost a limb. In order to stand, he had to have a leg. But the choices that were made in terms of what that leg looked like, these get at larger issues and larger stories about wanting to assert social status, about wanting to be refined and genteel, fears about citizenship and who could participate, right? I think larger questions and larger stories than simply mere physical need or mere physical appearance give us a chance to get at some of those things that people aren't necessarily writing down. Let's jump into the time warp. Normally, this is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. But today, we're going to let you use our time machine. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future but they can speculate about what might have been. If you could travel back into the 18th century, what object would you like to learn more about and what would you hope to learn about it? I love this question. I am ready for the time machine. I think so anyway. I've I've had all my vaccines, right? I should be safe for a while. I have to say that the moment and the artifact that I really would love to go back and see is one that just makes a brief appearance in the book, in the epilogue, and that's George Washington's dentures. So we know that Washington wore dentures. There's only one complete set, so both uppers and lowers that survive, and that's in the collection at George Washington's Mount Vernon. And as part of the project and in thinking about disability and handicap and the way that physical objects can fulfill or reconcile or solve that problem, I thought about George Washington's dentures. But one of the questions for me has always been, you know, did this look real in any way? Because as you look at them now, they're made out of ivory and horse's teeth and hippopotamus tusks and some human teeth, perhaps taken from people enslaved at Mount Vernon. So all of those kind of melded together. And as they've aged, you know, different parts have turned brown and different parts haven't. And the bases of them are made out of lead. So they really don't look in any way like they could fool anybody. But in the 18th century, you know, people seem to say that they looked pretty convincing and that they were pretty believable. So I would love to go back, maybe if Washington would invite me to one of these presidential events at the president's house. I would love to see, you know, what they looked like. He supposedly tinted the edges of them with red wax to make them look a little bit more like gum. So I would love to see, like, is he doing that? And then, you know, dentists recommended that you not eat with these kind of false teeth in because they might break and pop out. But I would love to see if Washington really did that. Like, was he trying to eat with these or was he not? We know that his dentist writes to him and says, like, your teeth have been discolored by port wine. So he seems to be drinking with them in. So I would love to be there and see, like, as people are making these toasts, like, is Washington leaving the teeth in for those? And just sort of hear the scuttlebutt. Like, are people saying, oh, yeah, those teeth, they're so not great, but we love Washington, so we're not going to say anything about them. Or do people just believe them? Do they think that they look like real teeth? So those are the kind of things I feel like, you know, you could only really get a sense of as an observer on the ground. And I would love to have that chance to look at Washington's teeth and think about, you know, how they look. And hey, if Washington doesn't invite you to one of his presidential dinners, just do what others did. Just stop by Mount Vernon unexpectedly. 
<laughs> That's right. Maybe I can forge an introduction from somebody and get myself in for tea or dinner or something. Exactly. So now that you've explored the power of objects in 18th century British America, what aspect of history are you exploring now? So I'm at work on a second book project, and this project in many ways turns to a different cast of characters. So I'm interested in the plantation south in the 18th and 19th centuries, but thinking specifically about the role that enslaved African Americans played with portraiture. So thinking about enslaved people as producers, as viewers, and also destroyers of portraits in the south. So thinking about often British artists, but also Anglo-American artists who owned enslaved people who may have helped to grind pigment or to prepare pigment for portraits, thinking about enslaved viewers, so plantations on the South that have a range of paintings on the walls. You know, One of the audiences for those, though probably an unintended audience, are the enslaved people who worked in the house. So trying to recover what their reactions to these artworks were, and then trying to get at the affect or the emotional kind of power that artworks owned by white slaveholders might have had for enslaved and then free African-Americans. So we know during the Civil War, some African-Americans vandalize or destroy or alter some portraits of their former masters and mistresses or their ancestors. And so I'm really interested in how those aesthetic actions were ways of basically artistic resistance. So thinking about how the possessions and the art owned by white slaveholders might have allowed enslaved people to assert some agency. Do you have a website where we can find more information about you and how we can contact you with questions? The best place is really my faculty page, which is on the University of Delaware's Art History Department website. And that, if you follow the faculty link, I'm there. And that has my contact information and email address. And yeah, I would love to hear from folks who have questions or insights or want to chat about objects in the 18th century. Jennifer Van Horn, Thank you so much for revealing just some of the powers that objects had in 18th century British America. Thank you so much for the chance to speak. Objects are like time capsules. Time capsules that are definitely worth our time to open and study because they contain a whole lot of information about the people and world of early America. As Jennifer noted, objects encapsulate past people's hopes, fears, opinions, and worldviews. I mean, just think about the cityscapes she described. People in England commissioned cityscapes. But their cityscapes measured one feet by three feet. British American colonists, on the other hand, commissioned large cityscapes, those that measured two feet by seven feet. Why the difference in size? The colonists' large cityscapes symbolized their big plans. They promoted the idea that the colonists had built a civilized society out of the wilderness and that they stood poised to be productive members of the British Empire. Objects like colonial cityscapes offer us just a sampling of the amount of information that material goods can tell us about early Americans and the societies they lived in. Now, as Jennifer revealed, it's the emotional information that objects contain just as much as the factual information that make them so powerful for both their original owners and for the people like us who succeeded them. When we take the time to study objects from the past, we'll find that they can help us better understand the human side of history. Because history isn't just about dates and events. At its core, history is really about people, and often objects can provide us with better insight into who people are and were than paper records can. So I don't know about you, but the next time I go out to buy something, I'm going to think about why I'm buying it and what the object I'm buying can tell the world about me, because you never know whether it will survive and tell someone in the future something about your past. Look for more information about Jennifer, her book, The Power of Objects in 18th Century British America, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 136. Support for today's episode came from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, the new home of Ben Franklin's World and proud publishers of the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. Now, speaking of the William & Mary Quarterly, did you know that you could sample some of its awesome articles for free? If you have an Android phone or tablet or an iOS tablet device, you can download the OI Reader app. It's free, and in it, you'll find a trove of William & Mary Quarterly articles that you can access and read for free. And if you like what you read, you can also subscribe to an electronic version of the journal right in the app. For more details about the William & Mary Quarterly and the OI Reader app, visit benfranklinsworld.com WMQ. Finally, 
I'm still curious about the objects around you. What interesting objects do you own and what do you think they say about you? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. Oh, and if you're still listening, all those books about the Declaration of Independence stacked about my desk are for research the Omohundro Institute and I are conducting for our last preview episode of the Doing History to the Revolution series, an episode you'll hear on July 4th, 2017. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.